everybody. Welcome to another interview. I have David from Northeast Texas on the line. David is has been in the Bigfoot research world probably for several years, probably more years than we can than I know of. I'm so excited to have him on the phone because he's got tons and tons of stories. And instead of me setting this up, I'm going to let him take over here and tell us what's going on. David, how's everything going? Everything's going great. Cam, we have some overcast skies here in Red River County. Uh, we had rain the last couple of days. Today hasn't been as hard, but we've got this uh, cool breeze coming off the coast somewhere, and we're we're enjoying it as anybody would. I am in northeast Texas. I'm from Red River County. I belong to, own part of, and one of the founders of the Timberline Bigfoot Group. I'm just pleased to be here and and talk about Bigfoot, talk about anything anybody wants. But I'd like to do a shout-out. One of our members was injured in a head-on collision two weeks, three weeks ago. He barely survived it. So I'd like to shout-out to my old road dog, Perry Murray. Perry, I hope you're listening, and I hope that you uh, continue to improve. And I'd like to send another shout out to Miss Sherry Lynn. Okay, she is my fiance. All right, she's my fiance, and I'm I'm uh, one of these guys that's fixing to tie the knot either late spring or early fall of 2021. And 2021 will also celebrate 50 years of research. Oh, that's great! That little cool breeze you're talking about happens to be Hurricane Laura, doesn't it? Yeah, that's Hurricane Laura, <laughs> and uh, I have a good friend named Laura, and I wanted to make a joke, but I don't, I, I think I'll just pass. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> but, uh, You've been in the Bigfoot world for a long time now. Do you want to, can just, let's just take a few minutes and tell us how, how you got into it, what got you interested in it? Was it an encounter or what? Oh yeah, it was an encounter. In uh, May of 1971, I was about to graduate from high school. And my dad, my brother-in-law, and one of our cousins took me and another friend of mine who will remain nameless because I'd like to protect his identity as much as I can. They took us to Broken Bow Lake, north of Broken Bow, Oklahoma. It was supposed to be a fishing and camping trip, and that's basically what happened. But there was an island out there that over the years we've nicknamed Rebel Island, and you'll understand why in a second. My friend and I decided our last day we were going to go across the lake, tie the boat up, and hike up to the peak and plant a little small Confederate battle flag, the stars and bars. And back in them days, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a big political thing. So we climbed up this huge game trail. And I thought, well, you know, I know old Ho Chi Town is underwater out here. This could have been just an old uh, pathway that was made over the years while the while the residents lived there before they built a lake. We got up to this clearing. Now, had I known now, or then what I know now, about tree breaks, limb formations, things like that, I might have turned myself around and head back down the hill. But I walked up to one of the tree breaks, and I put that little flag in it. And my companion and I did our class yell. Then we started back down the trail. Going to the boat, we accomplished our mission. And we started noticing that uh, we could hear something moving adjacent to us, but out of sight. And those days in May, you got a lot of tree coverage over there. And we stop, it would stop. We walk. It would walk. It unnerved us. I mean, I was 18. I think my buddy was just turning 18. So we got off the path and started trying to angle down in a different direction that we didn't lose whatever was trailing us. It stayed right with us. We found ourselves on a rock ledge. We could see down, see the lake below us. And we heard what sounded like a grunting sound not unlike, uh, not unlike a hog grunt, and 
we just raised our heads and kind of turned them and looked up over us and standing above us a ways back. We could see the head and the shoulders of a massive, what we considered a gorilla. Reddish brown, it was swaying backwards and forwards. It was making this grunting type of sound. And when it stopped doing it and roared, that was when we jumped off the ledge, hit the ground below us running. We could hear this thing coming through the trees. Saplings were being busted off, limbs busted off, and it was gaining. We hit the beach. The boat was there. I got in, cranked it up. My buddy got in, decided he was getting out because this this fella, he, he liked to fight. And I thought, there is no way you can beat a gorilla. He said, I'm not fighting. I'm putting a marker up. He put a three-sided tripod-looking flat rock in the center of the path that we had originally gone up, jumped in the boat. We got out into the lake, and this thing bust through the trees onto the beach. It had to be anywhere from seven to eight, eight and a half foot tall. Uh, male genitalia, it was a male. He was, he was angry. He was roaring. He was slapping his chest like a gorilla does, flat-handed. He stepped into water after us. When we got out of there, he was standing chest deep in the water, still roaring, still bellowing and slapping the water. We got closer to our campsite, and my buddy said, I can't go back up to camp yet. And I said, why? He said, I've used the bathroom. He <laughs> said, and I can't let your dad, your brother-in-law, and your cousin see me like this. And I said, okay, can you swim? No. Can you hang on to the side of the boat? Yeah. He jumped into the water, popped back up, grabbed the side of the boat and just stood there for me or laid in water. I said, now can you tell that you're wet? He said, well, the wet? Yeah, I'm wet all over. I said, that's what I wanted. I said, uh, I'm going to paddle up here to the bank and you get back in. I went to an opposite bank because I dang sure didn't want to go where this thing had come out. Right. He got in. We cranked up again and went into camp. He got who rods a little bit about being wet, falling out of the boat. We sure didn't tell him, well, he don't know how to swim either. So we came back, and I immediately started going through any old used bookstore, looking for anything that might have told me what this was, because gorillas don't walk upright. Now, they walk on their bipeds, and they'll go on their knuckles and, and move, but this was like a man, and I knew that a gorilla didn't do that. I, could, I, I found everything I could find, but it was all about the Yeti in the Himalayas. Well, what would a Yeti be doing in Oklahoma? So I happened to have gone to my family doctor the following summer, and I was picking up a Reader's Digest, and it was a story about the Roger Patterson film, and it had a few stills with Patty, and I, my eyes got big, my mouth hung open, I, I was hoping nobody was noticing this kid that come to probably see a doctor about something, which I did. I was having uh, appendix problems, but I, I started reading about this. I walked up to the receptionist and asked, what are y'all going to do with these magazines? She said, I don't know. They just donated. Why? I said, could I have this one? I don't have it any longer, but she gave it to me, and I had a name for these things. Bigfoot and Sasquatch, which took me a while to learn how to pronounce Sasquatch. That's how I got into it. Wow. From that day on, I didn't care about hunting deer. I didn't hunt squirrels, anything like that. I worked. I saved my money. I bought me a good rifle. My buddy went to the Army and said he would never go back, and he has never gone back. And... When my son turned seven, I started taking him into the field with me. And he believed. He believed without sin. And over the years, he started seeing more. When he was in his 20s, he had his first encounter. And it was a it was a face-to-face encounter, a lot closer than mine had been. And so he became my partner. We formed our, our group. 
and he had relatives by marriage that had seen something in the past but didn't know what they had seen, and they got interested, and they joined us. We started out with four or five people, and now I think our our group, we, we don't charge for membership. It's by invitation, and you can belong to multiple organizations. We consider ourselves a family group, so sometimes we'll have as many as 20 or more with us in the field. A lot of them don't like to go out in the field because where we research, these things come to you after dark. We really don't have to pound a lot of ground. We'd like to be seen out there because we do believe they have watchers. And after dark, after everybody turns in, you can hear the heavy footsteps coming into camp. You can you can hear them going through pots and pans. You can hear them grunt once in a while, and everybody stays calm. Let me stop you there. Now, <clears throat> I want to go back. You're... Your first encounter was in Oklahoma, and you're still in this same area. That's pretty much where you have zeroed in on all these years, isn't it? Yes, it is. Let me say this. D- David is a great storyteller, and he's been – there's a lot of his stories online. I'm going to put a – I'm going to find a video or a channel that I know these stories are on, and I'm going <clears> to <throat> I'm gonna link it in the description below so you guys can go – Look at those, and I'm kind of hoping he doesn't cover those in this interview because he has so many, so many things going on through the years that that we get some some new stuff here from David. I want some current (laughs) stuff. I I know that sounds selfish, but... uh, And and I don't want you to have to retell a story you've already told. So we're, we're moving ahead in time from that first encounter, and tell us again how old you were. You were a kid. When all that I happened. was eighteen. Okay, I was eighteen years old, fixing to turn nineteen. But I was uh, that was in May of seventy one, and I was I was eighteen. And my birthday, coincidentally, is this Saturday, and I'll return sixty eight. Okay, that's and, how long I've been doing this. And and I've interviewed one of your. We've already talked to one of your partners, Rodney. I think that's. Yep. Uh, I, I'll I'll put that. I'll put that video as the end screen video to click on. So if you guys want to go right back to that one, you're going to hear some corroborating stories here or evidence. But let me ask you, let's let's get to today. Now, y'all, you all invited me to come out to Oklahoma. It was six months ago, I think, and I've never been able to break away for more than a day, so I haven't been able to come. But since then, you've had some pretty interesting activity going on there haven't you yes we have can you talk about uh, that yes i can because <clears throat> I'm, I'm not giving the exact location it's just on the shores of uh, uh broken bow lake right uh i'm going to go back to to last january we had uh some severe weather move in we were supposed to be out there and and i and another member of our group had gone out and as long as it was going to be just a little rain, it wasn't going to be a major issue. But it, we started getting reports from my friend's sister and and my son that uh, we was looking at some winter mix. And other people had already called and said they were going to have to stay behind. And they were urging us to come back. Well, one of the campsites <clears throat> that we use periodically, I had noticed something on a stump. We do carry weapons, and I reached in and took my three fifty seven Magnum out and just walked towards this thing because what I was looking at, I really couldn't tell if it was crouched behind this stump or if it was on this stump. I, I really didn't know. And as I got closer, I saw it was a hog's head. This hog was, was a cold gray wild hog, and its head had been totally ripped off of its body. Good grief. The body, the body was not there. The head still had brain matter. The left half of its face had been it had been impaled on a on this pine uh, stump. Somebody had cut the tree down at one time, or maybe the wind had blown it, but it left a real big, ragged-looking piece of pine probably about eight or ten inches long sticking up in the stump and that's what the head was impaled upon 
being kind of nervous about all this, I didn't think about taking my phone out and taking a picture. My buddy was saying, this is awesome. I said, this is a warning. I said, we're, we're going to leave. Call your sister, tell her to call my son, and tell her to tell him we're on our way out. So we, we left, and when we went back this past March, I drove down to see if there was anybody camping. Nobody was camping. The head was gone. So I, I said, well, we, we've got to find a place to camp. My friend Perry was with me, the one that I did the shout-out to. We had other guys coming, and they we had an idea when they would be there. We found a campsite. We kind of set up things. I had decided I was sleeping in my car. I wasn't going to sleep in, uh, in a tent because I had a nice inflatable air mattress, and I had nice warm blankets. I was going to be set for the night. But we got out. We gathered firewood. I sat down to, to have a drink of cold water, and I looked up on this adjoining hill, and standing between two trees, way up there, was a figure that looked like it was rocking backwards and forwards. This is why I know they have watchers. I asked my friend Perry, do you have your binoculars real close? Yeah. Get them for me, please. Now, in Rodney's interview, I think touched down on what they called a mutant Bigfoot. Yeah, that that's what and, I called and, it. It was yeah. he never called it that, but that's what I called right. it in the interview. So because it was so, well, what he was describing was not very typical. But go ahead. No, it's a non-typical Bigfoot. It's also a, uh, a subspecies that people either call a Janosqua or a Gugway. In my short stories that you kind of was alluding to, which all occur mainly in this area that we still research because I know the area so well. My principal cryptid antagonist is the Gugway and the Dogman. I took a pair of binoculars and I looked at this thing in the face. It had a snout. It was a Gugway. I handed them to my friend Perry and I pointed and I said, right up there, take a look. And he said, I can't see it. And I said, are you looking in the right place? He said, two trees, what, maybe eight foot apart? And I said, yeah. He said, there's only two trees. There's not anything between them now. Okay, I get up, I go to the truck, I get my gun out, and I lay it on the ground next to me. And I'm waiting to hear leaves, anything busted. But it doesn't. A few minutes later, I look up, and it's back. And then Perry saw it. Our, our friend, uh, Quartz, arrived. Quartz likes to set audio recorders out in areas and catch audio. And I knew that's what he was going to do. The first night, we heard all kinds of screams, all kinds of howls. Most of it was coyote sounding. Didn't really bother us. And that was a Friday night. On a Saturday, the rest of our team showed up, mostly in the daytime. Uh, My son made an appearance. He couldn't stay because he works heating and air conditioning and he needed to get back before Sunday when he went on call. So he was going to stay with us until dark. Come dark, most of the people that came decided, well, we don't have tents, we don't have blankets, we don't have weapons, we're going to go in too. But I'm going to leave a couple guys here. I thought, no guns, no weapons. I I haven't got tents to put everybody in. I can't put everybody in other people's vehicles without their permission. So they, they walked off with Rodney's son, and one of our young guests that had come with Rodney. I was walking around campfire. My son had left. Other people had left. I had a real bad flashlight. And Rodney calls me over to his side and says, we got company. This is what we don't tell. I have the authority to tell. There were eyes, glowing eyes, and they appeared. I know that if people, when I say a blue eye glow, they're going to say deer or something like that. No, <laughs> because this last sight, we could definitely see a canine head, canine features on this thing. Right. They were coming uphill from Lakeside towards us. Rodney said, do you still have your spare nine millimeter? Yeah. Do you have it on you? No, but you keep watching these suckers and I can get it. I got my nine millimeter for Rodney. 
uh, other guys had guns, but they they didn't realize the seriousness of it, and they thought that we were messing with them, trying to scare them. He got the writer of scary cryptic westerns and such. One of his best friends that's had a lot of experience, maybe they're just trying to get us scared. No, no, we don't do that. But this thing stood up on its hind legs and charged. Rodney shot it. Oh, my gosh. Rodney shot it in the shoulder of my 9 millimeter. It did not howl. It did not bite at the wound. It stopped, looked at the wound, and then he and approximately four more of these smaller creatures that looked very similar took off through the woods. Rodney tracked it. He was going to shoot it again, and it ran in front of these four boys walking, running up from where they had been carrying the shot. And Rodney could not take another shot because the chances of hitting an innocent civilian was enormous. They got back on that hill. They tore things up. Court's got uh, some great audio that is in our possession and will remain in our possession for a while. The next morning, we pulled out after we collected all the audio recorders. We all went our separate ways after we got back into on the Red River. I got my son on the phone, and he says, pick a date that we need to go back. I'm taking a, a team, and I want you to put together a research team, field research. So uh, that's what we are going to do on behalf of Timberline Bigfoot Group. Love to extend you an offer to join us on these days, and if you, if you choose to accept it, I will give you the dates in a separate text. We do have people that would love to be down there and mess with us. And I do not want anybody to get hurt that, that it's human. We did not see a gug wave, but we did hear a howl that was not wolf. And it didn't sound exactly like a Bigfoot that I've heard over there, but it was strange. We're going back. We're going. To, we're calling it our hostile expedition phase two. So far, we've got a lot of older members. I have, we have a member from New York that used to hunt with us all the time. He, he would fly in twice a year to go with us in Paris, outside of Paris, Texas, to one of our research areas. I have a good friend that is a former United States Marine Corps sniper, and he worked in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice as a prison guard with me and taught me how to think like a Marine. And he has, for the first time in years, I always invite him out because he, he, he's a non-believer. And I sent him a picture that I had taken several years ago. And I was talking to him on the phone one night, and I sent it to him. And he come back and said, Dave, is this real? Is this, is this actually real? It's not Photoshopped. You know it's not. You know me. I don't hoax. I don't lie about it. He said, I'm in. If you get me a rifle, I'm in. What kind of rifle do you require? He said, at least a thirty out six. He said, a three oh eight would be better, but a thirty out six would be fantastic. I said, How about a forty five seventy? And he got quiet and he said, You're you, this is a killing mission, isn't it? I said, If they get close enough and they, they act like they wanna join us for supper and that we're the main course, yeah, I expect you to drop them. He said, I'm in. Wow. He said, I just hope that you got an idea to keep them away from us. And I said, we do. We are putting up an electric fence around base camp. We've never done that before. We're stretching barbed wire above that. We're stretching barbed wire around nearby trees in case they want to sneak up and stand by a tree that maybe we can get blood and fur. We have a lot of good people with a lot of experience that want to be there. Rodney's been uh, contacting some that haven't been with us in a long time. They're all committing. And I will tell you, I'd love to have you commit and sit around the campfire with us at night and tell some Dixie cryptid stories. <laughs> nope, nope. I want to hear your stories. That's what I, I want to hear all y'all stories. And I got a little podcast machine and maybe I can record them. Well, you're going to, you're going to keep me posted on the dates, right? Yes, I'm. Uh, I am going to send you the dates. It was a, uh, usually my son would tell me when I can do this, but he, he said, look, I want you to pick the dates. I will make it work for me. And I said, all right. And he said, uh, start getting the word out. 
I have done that, and we use Messenger to get the word out. We've got our own little chat group in there. All of these guys know what is expected to make suggestions. Some of them will. Some of them are kind of shy about making suggestions. When this goes down, it's going to be fantastic because, like I said earlier, this is the only place I've ever researched. Once you get in there in the daytime, there's very, very little movement, very little birds flitting around from limb to limb or singing. It's like it's a sterile song. And we try to put something to our back that we can hear, like what we'll set up on this one. If, if it's not underwater, we'll set up in front of the lake. And the lake will be to our back and uh, some water to our side. And downhill slopes, they've got to come downhill towards us. And we've, we've got a few things planned. We have a decoy camp that's going to be set up with a tent outside the, the compound that we're building. It will have a mannequin inside. It will have a recorder of a baby crying. One of the guys suggested that we put a game camera inside, and as soon as the thing opens the tent to look inside, that game camera takes a picture. We feel like we're going to lose all of our equipment, but we still have an SD card maybe with a picture. Yeah, they'll take videos too, so set it to yeah. video mode. Wow, that's yeah. awesome. You guys are – I'm glad – I'm glad these things don't listen to YouTube because they could get some pretty valuable intel on what your plan is. <laughs> <laughs> You're giving it all away, man. But, yeah, but, you know, a lot of people would, would think, oh, they're just a bunch of country boys going out. And all the dogman experts say, uh, don't go looking for these things. Well, we didn't go looking for them. We researched over there for 15 years and never seen or heard anything remotely resembling a dog man. Yeah. And we, we were primarily there for the Bigfoot, trying to get the pictures, trying to get the film. We had no intention of dropping one. The guns were for uh, self-preservation. If we did have an encounter, that was turned hostile. And it's really basically why we still care is, is the dog men now have become hostile and the Bigfoot has just kind of disappeared. We don't know if they've run off and it's just a gugway type and the dog men out there or what. That's going to continue to be one of our deals is in the daytime. Uh, we have urged our members and our guests carry a handgun, a big handgun, but carry a handgun. You don't need to be traipsing around property out there with shotguns and rifles. The only rifle in town and in the group that's in daylight will be in a little sapper stand with my buddy laying in a tree with that rifle. He's the only one that's not going into the field. That is a fantastic plan. I mean, it's when I say fantastic, I mean, I've never heard of anybody doing anything like this. This is spectacular. I, I, I nor, I'll be real candid with you. Normally, I, I get invited on a few of these. Not many. Not really not many. And I just... You know, it's, I want to go, but I'm busy with my job and I'm busy with this channel and a podcast that we're starting to put together right now. And it's just hard. It just, sometimes it doesn't make sense to me to break away. However, this one sounds awesome. I mean, I'll bring everything I've got, cameras, uh, drones, everything I've got. I, I would, I, I'm going to try to make this. So make sure and keep me posted on it. Oh, I'm, I'm going to keep you posted, and Cam, I start planning the day after one of our expeditions. I plan these things. That's that's part of my job, and then I I start sharing it with my son, and he'll he may see some something that I didn't quite cover. Rodney will catch something I didn't quite cover, like the barbed wire. We got all kinds of barbed wire, big dog. Man, yeah, and it don't cost that much. I can I can go to places and you know maybe spend forty fifty bucks for a roll of barbed wire that's going to help people sleep a lot more comfortable. You know, there's a lot of people that would say, "Well, Bob, barbed wire is not going to stop any of these things." But I mean, I would if it's it's kind of like a deer, you know, like a deer or deer get in my garden a lot, and before I put up yeah. a fence, I used to just tie tie a fishing line. Just they couldn't see it, but if they feel it. They won't come through it, you know, and hopefully you'll get the same response out of these creatures. 
that's why we hope. But we hope they get close enough that they'll, they'll get in that barbed wire and jerk out of it and leave a little calling card that we can collect and find out if it's dog man. Is it, is it wolf? Is it coyote? Is it just a dog of some kind of species we don't know anything about? If we get long, stringy hair, then we can kind of figure that's going to be uh, Sasquatch, Bigfoot, Gugway, whatever. And we can, we're going to collect it. I've already started forming uh, collecting groups, one collector, and it be placed in a Ziploc bag. It will be labeled and brought to me for we do not corrupt the chain of evidence. Right. The problem with DNA is they have nothing to compare it to. But it's still, I, I still think everybody's always like, well, get, why, why didn't they pick up the blood? Why didn't they get a sample of the stools? Why didn't they get a this or that? Well, there's nothing to compare it to. I, I think it's good to collect this evidence. But yeah, Rodney was talking about, this is this is great because I will definitely link in, on the end screen Rodney's interview because I remember vividly him talking about these short snouted, strange looking creatures that were apparently running the Bigfoot off. I'm not going to say that I don't go over there very apprehensive. And more so since I have a fiance coming from Kentucky with her uh, daughters, grown daughters. They're coming in an RV, so you know where they are sleeping. I was told I, uh, one of my future stepdaughters uh, had, had told me me on a, uh, a video chat, I believe, you have to sleep in front of a door. And I thought, oh, wow. I, I'll tell you also uh, how how real this is. The last uh, May or June, whenever they sent out all that stimulus checks, first round, I paid my bills. I bought groceries for the for myself and the family but I call my, my extended family here, and I had some money left. I like my 357 Magnum. I really do. But I like the 45 Rock Island Armory Combat 45 even better. Right. And it cost, it cost enough money that it's definitely going to be in my possession. It's like a, a friend of mine said, well, have you shot it yet? And I said, I've shot it with Hydroshock in it a couple of rounds. And I know the hole that it made going through a old car on out the pasture of my son's stepdad's, that it put a hole in the door about the size of a golf ball. The hole it made coming out of the door was about the size of a tennis ball. Wow. And I said, that's Hydroshock. And I said, I'm going to be using Hydroshock. I'm going to be praying that they just come in close enough that the video can work. But if the video doesn't work and they become really aggressive, there has to be a way to defend ourselves. And that's what we're going to do then is single one out and try to take one down and maybe the others will run off. Going back to Rodney, y'all are sure he hit that one that he shot at with yeah. your nine millimeter? Yeah, we heard the we heard the impact when you hit. Did, was there any blood or hair or anything left no, behind? No, we, we, we checked within minutes of them leaving. And then we went out again the next morning when we got up to make sure, followed it, the path that it took out of the area, and we found no blood. When did you all start noticing these, David? How, how far back does that, how far, I mean, they probably showed up. Uh, Y'all probably don't get down there. How, how often do you get to your to this area? Maybe twice a year. Okay, so they could have showed up three or four months earlier. But when did y'all first notice in this different kind of creature? Well, when we first noticed it is when I found the, the hog head. And this hog, uh, Cam, probably would have weighed 250, 300 pounds, full size. Hard to estimate, just a head. We noticed then that things had started being a little quieter. Our previous trip over, we, we knew we had people camped up where I found the hog head and, and another section of this larger campsite. And they were burning fires bright. They were taking spotlights and shining lights down below them. We knew something was up. We didn't know exactly what. We only heard one or two vocalizations that didn't sound quite right to us on that trip. 
but we weren't bothered where we were. But we think that at least one of the camps had these things messing with them or trying to get around them or something like that. But then something was said about dog men, and I said something about the Gugway. So they had decided, well, we'll come back over here in January. There won't be anybody camping. If it is, it's just some hardcore fishermen or something that they're not going to pay any attention to us. And went back over, and that's when I found the hog head, saw how brutalized it was. It, it was not a clean cut like somebody killed a hog and cut the head off or chopped the head off. This was this was ripped. Was it? It still had. Was it in any kind of state of decay or was it fresh? It was fresh. I'm figuring it, it couldn't have been more than 24 or 48 hours old because I turned the head up where I could look inside the brain cavity through the skull. The skull was still there, and I could see I could see red meat. So I know the brain was still intact for most of it. And then my friend said, David, part of his face is missing. And I got around where I could look at it. And knowing that Godways and Janosqua are often called face eaters, for a reason, I decided, yeah, we're getting out of here now. Because all he had with him was a 20-gauge shotgun. And when I found out that everybody else was being recalled, that John and, and his sister Deidre were calling people that were supposed to be going out there and telling them to turn around, the weather's fixing to turn bad on y'all, and y'all, y'all don't need to be stuck out there for two or three days. And so after I saw what was left of the hog and its shape, uh, even, even my buddy, was ready to go. So we knew in January for sure that things had changed. And this past March, we, we found out how much it had changed. Now we're we're alert. We know what's out there. Our older member from New York, when I told him about what happened, he said, what do you think it was? I said, most everybody calls them dog men. He said, I'm in, I'll be there. Send me the dates. And Dave, I don't want to have to go to all the getting my, my shotgun on the airplanes the way things are now. Can you can you find me or can I use a spare gun of yours or John's? And I said, Yeah. He said, I will be there. You be looking for me. And I said, We will. He wants in that fight, doesn't he? Yes he does. He he really wants to be in it. Okay, so you have the hog head issue which is terrifying. I mean, that's just terrifying. Uh, Two questions. One, was it a domestic hog or was it uh, feral? It was feral. The second question is, Rodney told me that he had had some visuals. Was that the weekend of the hog head incident or was that a subsequent trip? No, that was was an earlier earlier trip, yeah. Okay. One of his encounters or his sighting was in uh, 2011. And he was walking down the fire lane, and I had we had people going down another road, and Rodney was on the walkie-talkie saying he needed somebody to come join him. Uh, he had something. And when they got there with a flashlight, it was my son joining him, and Rodney had walked up, and his flashlight had caught one of these, he called a snout-faced Bigfoot, and it said it covered its eyes. He said it had no paws. It had fingers like him, but they were huge and covered in hair. Okay. He said, but it, it covered its eyes, and when I took the light out of its face, it went down the hill towards where we're going to be camped, hopefully, uh, this January. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, now, do you all talk between other research groups or other people that you know that, that aren't in your group? In other words, do you compare notes on what you're finding? We used to, but it, it has to be a two-way street, and now there is only... Uh, out of all the groups and all the different independent researchers, there might be a half dozen now we share with. And they're having similar stuff, but nothing exactly like ours. I'm wondering what their opinion is of of these things that you're seeing. Is it Does it line up with what you think it is? Yeah, it lines up. And uh, My friend from New York has been studying these things ever since people started talking about them. And he says, well, basically, all the descriptions are of a werewolf, like in the movies, only more woofy. And I said, yeah, I would I would say it. He said, but I do not believe that a man can turn into a wolf or a wolf can turn into a man. He said, these things, I believe, have been here for centuries. They just didn't show themselves. They probably killed a lot of old frontiersmen, 
mountain men and things like that, but they got too close maybe to a, to a den or something like that because you don't you don't read about stuff like that in the old days. And I said, well, you know, the one thing that the one story that sticks out to me that was not a Sasquatch kill was the Teddy Roosevelt story about the trappers Bauman and his buddy Jessup. The bites in the neck, things like that. I've read several versions. And I said, that sounds like a Gugway or Janoska walked up behind Jessup and killed him. Yep. Because it was non typical of regular, uh, a regular Bigfoot or a Sasquatch encounter. They like to scare the hell out of you, pardon my French. They can be aggressive, they can be deadly. They probably have been something that's killed hikers, campers, and it was just a an opportune motive for food and, and maybe an area that was short of food. And I said, I can't blame them for being what nature made them. But I said, I can blame them for trying to get to me. <laughs> well, I mean, it's like a bear, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you're you're not going to walk away. You can't, so you can't just let a bear eat you and, you know, that's say, right. well, that's, he's just doing what he's doing and not defend yourself. It doesn't make sense. So No, it doesn't. But you are going there. You are I am, you are going into are their going, territory, so right. It's an invasive expedition. I, I you know, I've I read where some people talk about you have to be non invasive. How can you be anything but invasive when you know it's their territory and you're going into it? Right. You may not have the opportunity to see one, they may stay out of sight. You may not even have the desire to actually see one it's just a good camping spot and you want to get away from civilization for a couple of days but when they show up and they're they're acting belligerent they're acting aggressive there's no way of saying if you just fire a warning shot that they're going to flip you off and walk off they may charge and you have got to have it in your mindset i'm going to do everything i can to kill you before you kill me exactly that's right that is fascinating stuff. I didn't expect I didn't expect to hear this kind of stuff in this interview. Rodney called me earlier in the week and he said, We want to tell you about some stuff that's going on, but I want David to tell you. And I said, Well, okay. Yeah. And you and I had been talking about doing this probably for six months and for one reason or another we hadn't been able to connect, but I'm glad we did. I guess we'll just wait to if I'm able to go, then I'll report to the audience, and maybe I can get us all three on the line and, you know, do a show and talk about that, what we did. That and, would be fantastic. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Or just record it all there, because I do have a podcast machine now. I'm real proud well, of that thing. I just want. I'm dying to use it. <laughs> well, I, I'm. I'm sure. I'm sure if you wanted to do a podcast there, there'd be a lot of people sitting around the campfire wanting to wanting to chime in. Some of them have uh, experience. Some of them are, are brand new to all this, but they ask good questions, and I, I know there's some old boys here that can answer them. All right. Well, we're pushing an hour here, and I try to keep these about an hour, David. But let's don't let's don't stop this yet, because I want to tell everybody about your writing, David. Okay. David is a a writer, uh, nonfiction and fiction, and he's working on a book of short stories i believe that all of his stories are loosely taken from some of his encounters and encounters that he's heard among other topics you want to talk about that a minute and he's going to be publishing a book it's not available yet he's putting it together but talk about your writing a little bit david i write about morgan dawson he encounters a lot of gugway he encounters a lot of of your classic werewolves men turning into wolves. He uh, He's encountered dog men more than one time, and they don't turn into men. They're vicious. Right now, uh, I am working on a series of short stories, which this will be the mainly the book, because these have never been read on any channel. The book title will be Dawson. In the first story inside, you're going to find the Nosferatu incident. Nosferatu, another name for vampire. It's been a, a love to write this because I'm not a big vampire man. I don't dwell on it too much in, in writing, or and I just really don't like to write, watch movies about vampires. They they pretty much follow the same formula. But this one, 
It's not going to follow the standard formula. There is a gunfight between the vampire and Morgan Dawson. Morgan Dawson is a he's a gunfighter. He, he's he's everything that that Liz Lamar ever wrote about. So fast that you you didn't want to blink or you'd miss it. Things like that. He is he is that, that good. I also write a series of westerns about cattlemen named Henry Clay Wallace. He encounters mainly just Gugway. Once in a while, regular Sasquatch, they have a hard time dealing with men. I have a family. And if this all sounds similar to the Louis Lamar formula, it, it, it is. Because yeah. I have about three copies of every one of Louis Lamar's books. <laughs> he, he's my favorite author, bar, bar none. Yeah. It is the stories of Dutch England, his brother Henry England, their father Abraham, and their brother James. They have a ranch on Crazy Woman Creek, which I've written about in other stories that weren't as contemporary. We're still sitting in the frontier. Crazy Woman Creek is actually two creeks in the area that we hunt. So while I'm describing one, further in the book when I talk about further up the creek, it's a separate creek. A friend of mine said the other day, you are to have two signs made before you go over there in January. One that says South, South Crazy Woman Creek and one that says North Crazy Woman Creek. And I started laughing about it and I said, that that could work. At least I'd get to be remembered for naming two creeks that have no name. Right now, I've, I've created two more of the Anglin members, their cousins. They figure in this, this new story of the Nosferatu incident. I have a love interest in, in the book which I did not have until I got engaged, and that became uh, necessary for me to, to include. And I have a, a good friend that's also a fan that had written me a, a message on Messenger that said, Dave, Morgan can kiss the girl once in a while. <laughs> and I thought, oh, man, don't do this. I, I, have a, I have a successful formula. Don't mess with my formula. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> They're all good stories. I had heard before my other stories all disappeared that uh, my contemporary stories weren't as exciting. But I, I think it was just Western fans that were saying that because I, I had some that were really good. I'm trying to find someone that would like to ride trail with me and narrate the, the stories that I have, re-narrate them, uh, that doesn't have an English accent, that doesn't describe a gun as a four or five Colt, <laughs> What's well, so hard about saying a forty-five coat? Yeah, I mean, uh, and a uh, four o dash seventy caliber rifle. Yeah, I mean, none of none of his his narrations. They were good. They got me noticed. I, I had a few followers. I'm not sure how many followers I really had. I've been told I had uh, several thousand. I know that I get messages from them. Want to know when and where can we hear the latest? Let me tell you this, we, you know, I'm, I've been working on a website for six months to launch our podcast and it's all going to be, I don't, I'll just say it here with you. It's all going to be original stuff. I'm not going to be re-uploading Dixie Cryptid stuff. It's all going to be brand new stuff and Dixie Cryptid, Cryptid doesn't change, but we're, <clears throat> I'm actually working on audio books too. People are sending me I've got two books that I'm narrating, and we're going to sell those on the website. So when you get your book written, when you get it published, and it's available in print or electronically printed, we could talk about maybe narrating that. I mean, you may not want me to do it, but we could find somebody to do it and maybe sell it off our website. But And sell, you know, I want to sell these at an economical right. price, And <clears throat> but it, it would be nice to be able to go to somewhere other than audible where you have to pay 15 right. bucks a month and just for you know 895 buy a, a six hour narration or an eight hour narration that's that's a good that is a lot of buying for your buck really i mean yeah it is eight hours of six hours of entertainment for eight bucks that's less than a dollar an hour i've always said books are that way they're the cheapest form of entertainment on the planet you know, you can buy a Kindle book for four ninety nine, and if you're like me, you're busy all the time. You only get about an hour, hour and a half a day to read. 
that's still great entertainment for a very low price. Anyway, that's what we're planning to do. So you and I can talk about that. Oh yeah, we'll talk about that. And uh, I, I'm going to say something. You sound like not exactly like me, but you sound like me. You're you're, you're you've got that country going. You got that Americanism going, <laughs> and you know how to pronounce calipers. You don't know how, that know how to pronounce gauges and, and things like that. And I would be honored when we talk about this more and reach a reach a understanding with each other for you to narrate my book. Yeah, we'll talk about that. I would I would I would be honored. Now you can't you can't come down too bad on the on the British accent because you know different places pronounce things different ways and there's a lot of there's a lot of nomenclature we use that people don't they're not yeah. familiar with especially in the south but one thing i wish they would learn how to say is aluminum aluminum yeah they call it alum yeah. aluminium it's aluminum yeah. <laughs> I, I, i've got a friend that can't say buick buick she really can't say buick and he comes out brook Bert, yeah. and, I'm, and I know what it, I know what she's saying, but it's still funny. And uh, there's words I can't say, so I, I don't try to make too big of an issue of it. Well, so there we go. Dave's going to have a David's going to have a book coming out, and we will make sure and help him promote that book when it's ready for uh, purchase. On I think he's going to go through Amazon, Kindle Direct, and I've told him that's a real easy way to do it. You just got to work out the formatting, get a book cover designed, and Probably, you know, I would pay somebody a hundred bucks to edit your book. They, they'll do it for yeah. next to nothing. But anyway, I'm going to wind this up. So I just want to thank David for coming on. This is fascinating stuff about these uh, different type of, and I called them in the last interview, mutant Bigfoot. But they're the Gugway or what was the other? I can never pronounce the other one. Janasqua. Janasqua. Those are creatures people would commonly referred to as dog men and i think they've got this big expedition coming up where they're gonna they've got a plan kind of get some hopefully get some video or something of these and i'm i'm not holding my breath on the pictures in the video because that is so hard to do yeah. but i really admire your tenacity in this but david thanks for spending time with us and we'll i'd like to get you back whether i go or not i'd like to get you back and find out how the expedition went if you're okay with that i'm okay with you have any parting right. words for everybody on Bigfoot? Yeah, let me give give parting words. Go ahead. Not everything in the woods is Bigfoot. Sometimes they're a lot more dangerous. Sometimes it can be your normal black bear. If you're in the western part of the country, it could be a grizzly. And then sometimes it could be just regular wolves. Just remember, not everything is Bigfoot. Be cautious and be safe. Yeah, those are good words. They're... Yeah, not every twig snap, not every piece right. of hair on a barbed wire is a Bigfoot. And, you know. Right. Probably see a horse or a cow walking around that pasture flicking that tail. <laughs> yeah. I've been with people in the woods, and they're like, you see that little twig? That's Bigfoot. You hear that sound? No. That's Bigfoot. Everything's Bigfoot. And no, so, no. Uh, well, listen, thank you again, and thanks to the audience for listening this far. I really appreciate you, and we'll see All you guys right. on the next video.